Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm, I'm Brad Graham. I'm the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Alyssa Muscatine. And uh, we're, we're very, very pleased uh, to be hosting another talk for the prolific uh, Elliot Ackerman, a former Marine and CIA officer turned journalist turned author, uh, who's here this time to discuss his new novel, uh, Halcyon. Uh, Elliot left the uh, the U.S. military uh, about a dozen years ago after serving several distinguished tours in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, with the Marines and, and later, later as a, a CIA paramilitary officer. Uh, he took up journalism, uh, living for a time in Istanbul and reporting on the civil war in Syria. Uh, and he's gone on to establish himself as a critically acclaimed author, uh, writing uh, previously five uh, excellent uh, novels, um, as well as two memoirs. Uh, anyone familiar with his uh, uh, with his work knows how thoughtful, uh, pr uh, pro probing, and graceful a writer uh, Eliot is. Uh, in, in Halcyon, he creates an alternate history that includes Al Gore as president of the United States. Um, the existence of a revolutionary scientific procedure that resurrects the dead, uh, and a movement to take down a statute uh, of uh, uh, the statue of Robert E. Lee uh, at Gettysburg. And the story that unfolds is, is narrated by a history professor working on a study of the Civil War and living on an estate uh, whose owner is someone who himself has been uh, brought back to life. Uh, only to confront a legal dispute over the inheritance that he left his three children. Anyway, I, I won't get into the, the various uh, plots in this brief intro, but suffice to say uh, the book's uh, blending of, of alternate history with science fiction uh, really does, does draw you in and you're compelled to grapple with a range of uh, profound questions that turn on, among other topics, the, the meaning and varying interpretations of, of history, the ethics and social impact of trying to thwart death, uh, and, and the role of fate. Um, and speaking of the role of uh, the fateful role of things, I hope we get this microphone working. Um, I'm sorry about the, uh, the feedback here. Um, anyway, as a book page reviewer noted, Elliot tends to prefer challenging questions over convenient answers. Uh, and the New York Times called his new book idiosyncratic and engrossing throughout. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing how Elliot, uh, whom we've always enjoyed having here, uh, ex explains the novel. Now in conversation uh, with him, we have a special treat. Uh, we have Lee Carpenter, uh, who's, uh, who's a novelist uh, also, uh, and a screenwriter, uh, and just happens to be married to Elliot. Uh, we don't we don't have this husband wife combination here uh, very often, um, but I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, uh, Lee's uh, Lee's uh, uh, about done with her third book, uh, which is titled Ilium. It's an international spy thriller, and it's due out in January. Uh, her resume includes 10 years as an editor in literary publishing, more than 20 years volunteering in various leadership roles at the New York Public Library, uh, and she's currently at Columbia. University as a lecturer in law. So please join me in welcoming Elliot Ackerman and Lee Carpenter. Thank you so much. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I was reminded of a time I went to hear, um, years ago, I went to hear Patty Stonecipher speak. She was the um, president of the Gates Foundation. And at the last minute, the moderator for the talk uh, got sick. And so Ever the Gentleman, her husband, Michael Kinsley, journalist, filled in. And when he sat down to interview her, he said, Patty, there's so much to discuss, but let's begin with what's important. What's for dinner? What so, is for dinner? So I'm not gonna, I, I will get to dinner later. Um, 
But this is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful book. I'm biased, but it is. Can we begin with you talking a bit about what the book is in your words and you doing a brief reading from the book? Um, thank you. Thank you for doing this, sweetheart. And, um, and thank you all for being here tonight. It's great to be back at Politics and Prose, which always feels like uh, homecoming and the home, home turf. So, um, well, this, this book is dedicated actually to uh, Lee's father. And uh, the inception of the book uh, was really right before the pandemic. Um, I had this very intense dream in which I was speaking with her father and he and I never met. He passed away in 2008 and Lee's, your, your mother and your father had a pretty significant age difference so that her dad was a World War II veteran. And he, uh, one thing I knew right away is he is someone who is much beloved, much beloved by the family that he left behind and, and much beloved by his community. So that when I got to know Lee's family, they were a constant refrain was always, you know, what do you think daddy would think about X? What do you think daddy would think about Y? Uh, and he always felt very alive to me. And so in this dream, um, I was talking to him and he was sort of telling me what he thought about X or Y. And that idea just, the, the way that dream felt stuck with me. And um, the protagonist in this book is not your father, but the idea of someone who was beloved in their time stepping into our time in which conventions and mores are changing, uh, at least what to me has always felt like at ever accelerating cycles just really interested me. You know, how would we judge someone who was beloved and a very good person in their time by today's standards? But then the problem is, well, you know, okay, well, how do I frame that question um, as a novelist? How do I frame it in a story? So uh, I'm gonna read kind of the opening of Halcyon because a little bit of writing advice I was giving a long time ago was that uh, if a reader is picking up your book, they're picking it up probably because it's got a good cover. I think this one has a pretty good cover. Um, and they'll stick with you for about two to three pages. So you've got to convince them within two to three pages that they want to keep reading. Uh, otherwise, you're toast. So, um, so I figured I needed to do the setup in the first you know, one or two pages. Um, so here it is. News of the great discovery trickled out. Resurrection, new life, had become a scientific possibility. The story ran below the fold in the Richmond Times Dispatch on an unseasonably cold Sunday in April. The two narrow columns of text described how a team of government-backed geneticists had leveraged findings from the recently mapped human genome to regenerate cells in cryopreserved mice. Weeks and even months after death, they were resurrecting these mice. I had read about the Lazarus mice in a rented guest cottage nestled in the foothills of the snow-capped Blue Ridge. My reason for coming here was to escape, among other things, the relentless binges of breaking news that over the years had quietly subverted and replaced what was once known as the National Conversation. The History Department at Virginia College, where I taught, but have since left, had granted me a semester's writing sabbatical, along with a healthy allowance. After finishing the Times Dispatch that morning, I pitched it into the stone hearth at the cottage's center, where a half-burned backlog still glowed. That is, I pitched all of it except the story on the Lazarus mice. I held on to that, choosing to save it for later that day, when my landlord, Robert Abelson, would come around for one of his early evening visits. These visits proved a pleasant interlude after tedious, unproductive hours spent at my desk. I had rented the cottage from Abelson's wife, Mary, who was more than 20 years his junior. This age difference, he admitted, had proven quite the scandal amidst the prudery of decades past. Less so now. Mary was an old soul and Abelson was anything but, which caused her to joke that he was, in fact, her younger man. Handsome in a minor key with clear bluish gray eyes and carefully groomed hair still flecked with strands of reddish brown, his appearance belied his 90 years. His face was high boned, his cheeks rosy and vital, his features distinct. He would have been a natural for caricature, except caricature freezes and his face was a paradigm of fluid expression, 
He was possessed by a vigor that he insisted was the result of his daily walks. He called these his constitutionals. It was after these constitutionals that Abelson would typically pay his visit, mixing us each one of his signature four olive martinis, and we would settle in on the cottage's lumpy furniture. Our talks would range in topic, animated by a collision of interests. My work, a study of postbellum attitudes on the Civil War, his life, service in the Second World War, a career as a prosecutor, and the behind schedule and above budget renovation of the property's main house, a white brick neoclassical with a wraparound porch they called Halcyon. The name itself linked to the estate for as long as anyone could remember and conjuring a nostalgia for better days. We'd drain our glasses and the hours would pass while we exchanged our drink-inspired truths. Inevitably, the conversation would turn to the headlines, which was why that evening I had saved the story about the mice. Before I get to Abelson's reaction to those mice, the year itself, 2004, is a necessary digression. That year and the confluence of forces harnessed to create its zeitgeist are as much an actor in Abelson's story as any one person. For those of us who lived through it, we can remember that it was a time when a frenzy pervaded our national psyche, with its liberal and conservative personalities conspiring against our collective sanity. From the political left and from the political right, America had learned over the years to binge on scandal, the Clinton conviction, on piety, September 11th, and on wrath, Bin Laden's body dragged from a cave in Tora Bora on Christmas Day. We had lost our ability to disaggregate our values from our rage. Opinion mattered. Accusation mattered. In recent memory, had there been a greater epoch of either? Had there been a time when a single word, anonymous or otherwise, possessed greater potential to undo the old order on, once we, on which we'd once relied? Destruction and creation were in the air. And so had there been a greater time of freedom? Didn't our flawed society need to evolve? And if we did evolve, would any of this associated destruction have been wrong? We didn't know. Anything could happen. Nothing was sacred. All thinking became absolute. We congregated to the poles of leftward and rightward consciousness. We hollowed out the center of our political life, unraveling the braid of our society, uh, societal obligations to one another, only to awaken and realize with wonder that none of those obligations were, or ever had been, any stronger than a single strand of thread. It was on those threads that Abelson's life would come to depend. But that night, the story of the mice was foremost in my mind. So, thank you. So, so that's sort of, as you know, that's sort of the setup of the book. And what we quickly find out is it's not just these little frozen Lazarus mice who have been brought from the dead by the Gore administration. Uh, it's Abelson as well. He's one of the test cases. And Martin, the narrator, is staying in his guest house. And so um, when he's brought back, he is this sort of man who was beloved in his own time, who is now not walking around in our time. He's walking around in this alternate 2004. And um, hijinks ensue. I'll just say that. And, and he's a man um, about whom I would say um, a very nuanced set of politics. Um, uh, he, he ascribes to a very nuanced set of politics. I mean, I think kind of like my own father fought for hugely progressive causes, but might have been considered classically a Republican in the way we think about it today. You know, this kind of relationship between the lack of nuanced thinking and therefore an inability to compromise and get anything done is a through line in the book, and I'll get back to compromises later. But um, one of the things that you have said about the book is that it is about the intersection of individual and national memory, which I think also is a theme throughout all of your work. So could you talk a little bit about that? Like, talk about memory as it relates to the themes of the book. Who is remembering what? Halcyon, of course, is a word that we think of when we think about happy times in the past. So. Yeah, I, I, you know, mem memory is something um, in history and the stories that we tell that fascinates me 
Uh, I think it's it's come up in a lot of my other writing, particularly books that really you know have dealt with war head on, because the we tell ourselves stories as a way to organize extremely complicated events that have happened to us, put them into a neat order, and then make meaning from them. Um, so the stories that we choose to tell in our histories, they say quite a bit about us um, as humans, you know, whether that be the stories you and I tell each other as husband and wife, or then the stories we tell our children about their family and things they can't remember because they were too little to remember them and, uh, and what that means our family values are, to the stories we tell ourselves about as a society. And those stories um, evolve. Um, I'm going to tread lightly here because my mom's here too, so there's a lot of family story dynamics going on. Um, but, you know, I'm sure people also have the experience of there's family stories and the children grow up and they say, I don't remember it that way exactly. And then, and then everyone's arguing about the story. And so, um, so we all, I think, have experienced that probably at the interpersonal level to a degree in our own families. But then there's this sort of broader question, okay, well, you know, what is a nation? Like a nation is a sort of a collective, it's a family. And what are the stories that the family tells? And there can be these whole swaths of time in which there's consensus about the story. But then there can be these moments of real change where the ground is shifting beneath us where everyone's saying, no, we're gonna start telling a different story and different voices are rising up. So Abelson is sort of a person who is, you know, he, he's stepping into a world that's starting to tell itself different narratives and different stories. And the characters in the book, um, so to include his wife, Mary, who you meet, his daughter, um, Martin Newman, the narrator of the book, who's sort of like a little bit of a Nick Carraway type character, um, they're all engaged in this story making. And, um, and the, the, the issues that the novel is sort of circling, things like monuments on battlefields and even kind of workplace intrigue and episodes from Abelson's past that are being dredged up. You know, I think those are all things that were in the, that are still in the air of our culture today, but they're very difficult to write about if you're just gonna like write about them in 2023 because they're such live wires for all of us. So I thought, you know, maybe we can, maybe I can put this in the, the nearest date possible to us that still feels like history. And when I thought about that date, it felt like, you know, 2004, like I feel like 2004, that's about as close as you can come up to the modern moment and say it's history. Um, one of my favorite parts in the book involves a story that you told me many years ago. When you think about the great stories that we tell ourselves as Americans, um, two of those stories have to involve World, World War II and the Civil War. Um, and the way you tell those stories depends on a whole set of experiences unique to you. Um, but you tell the story in the book of Section 16 at Arlington National Cemetery. Will you tell us what Section 16 at Arlington National Cemetery is and how it found its way into Halcyon? Sure. Well, um, Section 16, 16 um, there are probably people in the crowd that I know what you know, Section 60 is. The cemetery is divided into sections, and oftentimes they're affiliated with particular wars or time periods. Section 16 is the uh, Confederate section of Arlington National Cemetery. So I think, you know, Many Americans don't know that there are 482 dead Confederate soldiers buried at Arlington National Cemetery, and there is a Confederate monument at Arlington National Cemetery. So um, I think you know, when we talk about issues and you know, stories, we're wrestling about the narrative. I and mean, you know, one of the big ones in American history has always been the Civil War. And there have always been sort of these two, you know, the, the two counter narratives, you know, there's the lost cause narrative that we've been talking a lot about in recent years and, um, and how that kind of got reintroduced in reconstruction into America. Um, and then, you know, then, then there's obviously, you know, the narrative of, you know, Lincoln's narrative, you know, um, this is a war about slavery, a decision he made in the middle of the Civil War, that this is what the fulcrum of the war is going to be about, it's going to be our righteous cause. And I think sometimes when we talk about those stories, at least when I observe the conversation around those stories, I observe it as like there's two sides arguing and one needs to prove that it's right. And there's actually always been something to me that feels like that's not really necessarily the stakes here. Like the reality is, and this isn't unique to our own civil war, but the fact that there are two groups of people, they both have a story and they refuse to agree with each other on what the story is, that's the reason you're having the war. Like if they could agree what the war was about, you probably wouldn't be fighting the war. And um, as a journalist, I had this experience. When I was covering the war in Syria, I learned very early on that if you would kind of be sitting down interviewing or talking with a, a member of the Free Syrian Army, 
and you would say, okay, and then um, and explain to me where you were when the when the Civil War started. They would stop you and get very offended. Civil War? What are you talking? This is not a civil war. This you must understand is a revolution. Like, okay, sorry. And then you would sit down with someone who's sympathetic to the Assad regime, and you would mention the the revolution that had gone on. They, this is not a revolution. This is a civil war. Um, so irreconcilable narratives are what create wars. So specific. But why are those soldiers buried there? Well, I'll, so let me, I'll get back to it, sir. I'll answer your question. Such a good story. Sorry, dear. Uh, <laughs> so the re, and this is why, and so it's complicated. So it gets really complicated. So the reason those soldiers are buried there is that at the end of the 19th century, um, we as a nation had to go to war again as one country. And a real question that we've forgotten was, well, is the South going to fight with the North? You know, the Civil War is relatively recent. Will Southerners agree to go fight with the North? And that war was the Spanish-American War, which was a war of empire. Um, that really, you know, you know established uh, our possessions in, uh, uh, in, over, uh, in the Philippines, um, you know, the war in Cuba. Anyway, so we, we fight that war. We win that war. When we come back from that war and sort of so to unite America in that, President McKinley felt, well, a good gesture would be to try to, to, to acknowledge Confederate valor and say we are going to bury, as we're burying America's war dead from this war in Arlington National Cemetery, mixed with those fresh war dead, we're going to bring up Southern soldiers from the South and bury them. And actually, the greatest voice of opposition to this were Southerners. It's like, we don't want you coming and digging up our dead and moving them north where we can't visit them. And they said, no, 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 this will be good. And the thing that complicates it even more is another reason. It wasn't just actually to unify Americans in fighting the war. On the back end, after we won that war, we needed to ratify the peace treaty, which was the Treaty of Paris with a two-thirds vote in the Senate. And, the, and so President McKinley need to ratify that treaty and consolidate our new colonial possessions in the Philippines and in Cuba, he needed that treaty signed. And his greatest source of opposition against American colonialism abroad were these Southerners. So in the name of American colonialism, we dig up Southerners and put them in Arlington National Cemetery. So like when I say it's, it is, it's complicated. Like who, when you, I mean, maybe if, as I'm telling you the story, you said like, I have a hard time organizing who's on the right side and wrong side of that argument. What? It gets very tangled. Just one last question yeah. on section 16 and how are they buried? They're buried in a circle. They're buried in concentric circles so no one can be added to them, as opposed to the long lines and rows in Arlington National Cemetery. I think that story is such a perfect metaphor for the complexity of political compromise. Um, can you talk a little bit about the significance of Abelson's having served in World War II, back to the narratives we have often told about that war and service members from that war, and if you wanted part of the book to be about that narrative and looking at that narrative as aligned with or in conflict with the Civil War narrative? So I think that I, um, intuitively, I wanted Abelson to be someone that at just, if you met him and had spent 10 minutes with him, you'd be like, wow, this is a great guy. Like he, I mean, he fought for all the right causes as a lawyer uh, in his legal career, and he had this really, you know, a good solid war record in a war that was a good solid war, World War II. But, and without any, any spoilers, as you get into the book, you realize, as is often the case with anyone's history, and even the history of any war, it's complicated. Like, his history in World War II is a little more, it's not nefarious, but there's, you know, it's, it, it's, there's a lot of baggage there. And so I wanted the reader to, to see through the story some of that baggage getting unpacked. Um, and I'll just add, uh, Martin Newman, the narrator, you know, who you meet in the opening pages, he's not like Abelson. He's kind of like a down on his luck associate professor of history trying to finish his first book, and he's a divorcee, and he's basically like living in this guy's guest house. So the interplay between Abelson and Newman it was important for me too, because I wanted you to see these two individuals in juxtaposition with one another. One who, you know, is so obviously good um, and complicated with one who kind of seems like a little bit of a loser, but you realize as you go on that he does have some of his, I hope, endearing qualities to you as a reader. Yeah, and one is a scholar of war and one's a veteran, and you're both. Um, but I think it was the New York Times compared um, your narrator to Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby 
And I thought that that was a really interesting point because in both cases, the narrators are looking at this other person and trying to figure out the truth. Um, but I was around when you were writing this book and I don't think we ever talked about The Great Gatsby. Was that in your mind at all when you were writing it? It's always in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> because that's a war story. It is, it is. Um, Lee and I often talk that um, I think there are, there are a number of books in a, well, war is such an undercurrent of the American story that it's very difficult to extrapolate the war from story. So I think it's less, is there war in much of our literature, and it's more just sort of which books get thrown in the war pile and which get thrown into other piles. So The Great Gatsby, you know, if, if you've read it, is a book that, you know, is a war novel. I mean, you know, Fitzgerald served in the First World War. The whole, the whole novel turns on a plot device that's anchored in the First World War in Gatsby's service. Um, so for me, though, kind of that, fr I, I don't know if I was actively, I wasn't necessarily actively thinking about that frame. I think the frame I was thinking of was I wanted the narrator to feel like he was in opposition to Abelson, like he was looking up to Abelson, and Abelson has a secret. And maybe I've just read The Great Gatsby enough times that it was sort of in my subconscious, because that is the great, you know, it's, Karen Carraway is looking up to The Great Gatsby, you know, who is this man, and he has a secret, he just knows he wants to be near his energy and admires his energy, and then, you know, this sort of mystery unravels, and it's a bit that way um, with Abelson and um, Martin Newman, although there's just more of an age gap between them. There's another sort of ghost who hangs over the book and then is actually very present in the book, and that is the kind of off-stage character of Shelby Foote, the Civil War historian. And I want you to talk a little bit about Shelby Foote, but I saw um, this hat, I think it's a Ron DeSantis hat, but it, the, uh, the, the slogan on the hat is, make America Florida. And, um, <laughs> right, they're, they're always so witty. Um, and that slogan, make America Florida, made me think about an interview that you shared with me years ago, which was an interview with Shelby Foote in 1994, uh, you can Google it, and in this interview, Shelby Foote talked about uh, something he calls the Great Compromise, which may be familiar to many of you, is not familiar to me. Um, and this is how he describes the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise is that the South admitted freely that it was best that the Union was not divided, and the North admitted freely that the South had fought bravely for a cause in which it believes. And that compromise seems almost unimaginable now, or the idea that two sides really ideologically at war with one another would agree to disagree in this way or agree to have, in a way, empathy for the other side's point of view. And um, I thought a lot about the Great Compromise when reading this book and, 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 and the complexity of proposing an idea like that. Now, can you talk a little bit about Shelby Foote and where he sat in your brain as you were writing this book, and I think I think he is a f I mean he, I think he's a fascinating figure. So for anyone who's not familiar with Shelby Foote, um, you may have experienced him tangentially. He was f really came to national fame in around 1990 when Ken Burns' The Civil War came out, and of the talking heads in the Civil War, I mean he I think he's in like seven he's like has 70 percent of the, the scenes, and he uh, he was a novelist actually. And after, he wrote a novel called Shiloh, which was a historical novel of that battle. And afterwards, the head of Random House, um, as the centenary of the Civil War was coming up, um, said, would you mind writing a, you know, maybe like a narrative history of the Civil War, just, you know, that we could have ready. And he said, I'll think about it. Um, let me get back to you as I plot out what this will be. And he got back to the head of Random House, said, okay, listen, I will write your centenary. And this is like in 1959 or 60. Um, but it's not gonna be a 250 page book. It is going to be three 1,000 page volumes, uh, which became Shelby Foote's life work. And his book, The, the Civil War, um, uh, a narrative is, is, is pretty amazing. Um, I would actually recommend it to you all on Audible, uh, which I did a couple years ago, which is another story. It's 152 hours. Um, so you can, you know, I did three hours a week. That was great. But he, I, for a long time after the Ken Burns, I think, you know, it, it was beloved historian in the 90s and in the 2010s, but then recently has sort of very much fallen out of fashion. Um, you know, he's a Southerner, and the narrative history 
Um, I experienced I experienced reading it just you know it has a little bit more of a southern perspective, but you know he's writing from Mississippi. Um, but the idea is, I think, with Shelby Foote, he's almost the walking embodiment of how our attitudes on issues will change. And so someone who was, as, I mean, he was parodied on Saturday Night Live in 1990. I mean, like he was just, you know, he was someone everybody really was, you know, in love with. Um, and he's very endearing. And now many of his comments are, as you read, they're, they're sort of things that we would look askance at today. And so I wanted him as a figure in the novel to be almost like an anchoring force that maybe a reader will recognize um, and recognize some of his views and then be asking themselves how those views would pass muster um, today. So Shelby Foote sort of has, he walks on and off stage a few times and my narrator, uh, Martin Newman, is sort of haunted by his ghosts and the idea of whether or not compromise is truly um, the most essential American virtue. And another Shelby Foote quote is, it is basically that. Shelby Foote says, the genius of America has always been our ability to compromise and the Civil War was fought because that was the one. You know, he says, we were not the only country that was reckoning with slavery at that point in our history, but we are the ones who fought uh, an incredibly bloody war that killed one thirtieth of our population over it, and it was that 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 was our great failure to find a compromise. So the novel asks that question: you know, is compromise inherently a virtue, and are there some issues on which we should never compromise? Um, and and this is sort of outside the scope of the novel, but I'll just finish by saying that you know I think a lot about in our society today, the the pool of issues on which there is no compromise. Um, because they are just black and white, seems to be growing. And the pool of issues on which, well, no, compromise is actually healthy. This is something where we should find compromise is shrinking. And what does that mean for society when the issues that the society is wrestling with um, are becoming more vast in the bucket, the no compromise bucket? Yeah, and I think that Shelby Foote, like Abelson, and I saw Claire Detterer's book, A Monsters in Your Window, which gets at the same issue, um, where men sort of lionized in their time as astute, passionate experts, and then history has raised some questions about them. Um, just a funny anecdote about Shelby Foote. His childhood best friend was Walker Percy, and from the time they were four years old, Walker Percy wanted to be a doctor, and Shelby Foote wanted to be a novelist, and that's all they talked about, and so Shelby Foote started writing, and Walker Percy went to medical school, and then Walker Percy got sick, took a year off from medical school, wrote The Movie Goer, which, which became one of the great classics of literature. And Shelby Foote probably crawled into a hole for 40 years, but then came back with this like incredible masterwork. So Shelby Foote's like an interesting story about the journey, the journey of a writer over time. So one last question, and then we'll go to the audience. Um, one of the myths, my father loved Greek myths, and one of the myths he really loved was the story of Tithonus. And because I heard these stories ad nauseum when I was a kid. So Tithonus was a mortal who fell in love with a goddess, and because she loved him, she asked Zeus, to um, give him immortality. She forgot to ask Zeus to give him eternal youth. And so he was condemned to, um, well, as my father used to say, that story didn't end well. It didn't end at all um, because he just lived on aging forever and ever. And you know, now that we've talked about war and politics, another just really poignant, masterful thing in this book that I think is also the emotional core of the book is this idea of what would it be like if we could bring back our loved ones and what would be the costs of that and what are the downsides and in the character of Abelson you know what what if you were brought back from the dead and you really didn't like what you saw or you had complexity or you had warring children um, so how did you how did you get to thinking about um, the, the risks of that kind of incredible technology as all we read about now all day long are the risks of incredible technology. Well, I think um, in the book I present it as being actually a little bit banal. So like there's this huge revelation, guess what, we've cheated, we've cheated death. If you want and you can pay for it, you can resurrect people you know, from beyond the grave. Everyone sort of goes about their business and life just sort of like relentlessly carries on. And, um, and I don't think that's unrealistic because we're like sitting here at a moment right now where we've all been told that at least half of us are going to be out of the job because of artificial intelligence and, you know, you know, the world is about to radically change. So I think that there is a persistence that life has um, that I wanted to show in the book. But I think for me, again, 
you know, I hope someone reading this book, it causes you to think, because it's framed a little bit as a thought experiment. And in writing the book, it caused me to think. And so once I had landed on this idea, okay, I'm going to bring this one character back, and I'm going to see how he walks through the world, the question is, okay, well, he's come back. So um, what about the people around him who are confronting death? You know, How does he relate to someone who says, actually, I think I'm just going to do the usual thing and call it quits at the end of my life? And and uh, you know, what are the implications of those types of decisions? Um, so you know, those are things I think I, th I I think about in a speculative way, and you know, and just obviously in a non-speculative way. And uh, Kafka has a a great quote um, that I like that probably could have been the epitaph of the book, which is, um, uh, "The meaning of life is that it ends." He was so dark. So dark, but funny and pretty true. You know, if like if it never ended, I mean, you know, what, you know, I think it would be very tough to make meaning and to tell stories. So, um, so as you get, and I don't want to. If, I hope I'm not sounding too elliptical, but it, I don't want to give anything away in the book because all of these questions come up in the back half of the book, decisions that Abelson has to make, decisions that people around him have to make, uh, and how they make those decisions in ways that feel ethical and as though they have meaning. Um, so um, so I, I certainly had a lot of fun writing it. It's a beautiful book. Thank you. Um, we, have, we would love questions. There is a microphone here. Um, if you could please come to the microphone for the questions because that way we are able to record your questions. And please ask questions. No, if our kids were here, they would definitely go be, be fighting over one another for the mic. goes around, comes around. And in terms of everything being cyclical, I'm wondering how you think about, can you all hear me? Okay, didn't you get my question? I when this compromise, you know, when we, you know, what we're transitioning into, if we're transitioning at all. Mm -hmm. I think, so the question was what goes around, comes around, and, um, and what are we transitioning to? I think f the, yeah, that you know, fundamentally, that's what the book is about. It, it is about um, how decisions and lives lived in a certain time can be viewed as as honorable and appropriate, and how in another time they can be viewed as amoral. Um, there's a moment in the book, um, pretty early on, where Martin Newman is in a flashback. Um, him and his best friend is a character who's also a historian. Um, from Mississippi, they meet their hero. Um, it's like they're going to meet, you know, Lou Gehrig um, to get their copies of a narrative history signed by Shelby Foote. And Shelby Foote inscribes uh, Newman's narrative history to him as um, never forget that history is what the living think of the dead. Uh, and I think that's sort of how what goes around comes around. And we live in an age right now um, where sometimes there, there seems to be an ever increasing temptation to believe that all morality. Uh, and all manners are fixed. And as Americans, I think we are exceptionally good at living in the now and in the present and pretending as though the past doesn't exist and the future will never arrive. Um, but it always does. And when it does, as you so eloquently put it, what goes around comes around. And you might get judged too. Okay, just do a PS to that. But you've been through war. You've been through a lot of war. And you've dealt with the mentality of the soldier. And I don't know, and it seems like that seems to be somewhat ingrained anyway in the American personality or persona. Um, so I don't know, you know, as we're talking and we see what's changing in terms of the world. So just strictly from your observation, I'm wondering will you sort of see this transitioning if there is such a thing going? Or will it will certainly not be in my lifetime? That's the uh, Which thing? Sure. Well, I think I think we um, we certainly are at a very at a moment with lots of division in our country, and I think we are at a time when we are trying to tell ourselves stories that seem to cohere. And by cohere, I mean we're trying to tell ourselves stories that allow our society to cohere. So there's a critical mass, and we're not kind of dealing with the 
um, the perpetual crisis we've seemed to be in for the last however many, you know, half dozen or plus years, depending on when anyone wants to, to, to pick their beginning point. So I think the, so I think these stories, I think stories really matter. And, uh, uh, and you can see the stories that are being told in this novel, some of them are political stories, and they're ones that I'm just making up, but I think we should all be very cognizant of the stories that our leaders are telling us and the stories that our society uh, is producing. Abelson says, um, tearing down monuments isn't too many steps removed from digging up graves. That same idea of... Yes, and I think, uh, as he notes too, when you start digging up graves, dead people and even dead ideas, you need to walk out, watch out because they start walking around amongst the living. So be careful. Hi, thank you very much. Um, uh, you spoke eloquently about uh, the 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 way that Shelby Foote sort of viewed the Great Compromise and the uh, the the Great uh, I, f I forget the words you used. I apologize for that. But as these sort of two overarching narratives that we sort of had to compromise on, given what you know <clears throat> about the current state uh, uh, of America, what do you think are the current narratives, and I know there are probably, you know, there are a number of narratives involved, but the, what do we think are the two competing grand narratives on both the left and the right? And do you think that we too will eventually compromise or will we end up uh, elsewhere? So thank you. Sure. Um, well, I'm going to do my best to answer that question, understanding that uh, I'm in Washington, D.C. It's tough to give a nonpartisan answer and there's more of you between me and the door than I think I could get through. Um, I think, well, listen, I think we're in a really interesting um, moment in our country's history. I think that uh, uh, the stories we tell really matter. I think there has been oftentimes the world is presented to us as though it's left versus right. Um, but I increasingly believe that the, the true narratives are much more complex than left versus right. Um, and I think, you know, we're sort of, you, you know, you see that sometimes manifested in polling numbers and the candidates who are running. And I think, you know, there's also elites versus populists. And so there's a bit of a sorting going on right now. It's interesting when you see um, certain, certain unlikely allies uh, in the Congress, for instance, on certain issues. You know, when you'll see like um, the far right and the far left meeting on things like opposition to the war in Ukraine and, you know, I pay attention to that. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. They have that in common. So, you know, there's this sort of the whole uh, uh, buffalo theory, horn, the horns of the buffalo theory. You know, the idea that you go you go far enough out to the left, you go far enough out to the right, the two points meet in the middle. So I think, but that is just indicative of that there is this great sorting and compromise and potential for compromise uh, as we move forward. So I think we need to be, you know, paying attention because I would be shocked if in 15 or 20 years things looked how they looked right now. I think there'll be new stories. Hi, I have, um, <laughs> this may be more of a, a comment than a question. When it comes to stories, particularly thinking about the younger generation, I feel that our ignorance is not bliss. And although I had a wonderful public education where I grew up. There are things that should be told in families, especially who has in these stories family members from the Civil War. If I had my way, I would like to know from those of my family who served in the Civil War, even the Revolutionary War, that how many people know or have the opportunity to hear stories like, I grew up in North Carolina, South Carolina, and my grandparents and the neighbors would sit on the porch in hushed tones talking about all the German U-2 boats seen up and down the Atlantic coast, very close to the shores of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, or um, having your your grandparent as a child say that they grew up in Boise, Idaho, and there were some of those, um, what they call them, 
the balloons that the Japanese sent up to do whatever mm -hmm. they were supposed I think they were supposed to be some kind of bomb. Uh, I think those kinds of stories are significant that we need to know, you know we need to have some of that for the younger generation so that they don't think that the United States is infallible and you know nothing else like God forbid that 9/11 should happen I, I I think it's I think it's a great observation and I think the um, well I, yeah. I I won't speak for I don't want to speak for you but we you know we have kids and I think it's great when you uh, you know when you can see how your kids perceive these issues and I think at least our children lived through a pandemic and I think that gave them a sense of something historic that they lived through no, thank you for that. I was just going to say that by the time I was a teenager, my dad was in his 70s, and I was such a dumb kid. It never occurred to me to say, please tell me what your life was like when you were 15 or you were 25 or you served. Or He was gone before I ever thought, God, I could have learned so much from him, which is just like such a cliche that's so often true. But I think those of us who are lucky enough to talk at length with our grandparents will only benefit from that. So, um, Elliot, I'm not too far into the book, but clearly quite engaging. And uh, I'm sure there'd be a, a much deeper questions that I might ask because of many issues you raise and, and the stories of the book. But it, it seemed to me very curious that here's Martin, uh, who uh, was not aware that Abelson had passed. And it's sort of an irony there as an historian that he would not have taken time living in this cottage to have Googled. Did that come, did that ever? Well, it's 2004, so there's no Google. Okay, well, that's okay, <laughs> right. No, it's, it's <laughs> not that he, right, thank you for that, reminding me. No, I had to, thinking I had to the president. myself as I wrote the book. Right, but, but it's not as if he still could not have done some research, so I just wondered if that ever Crushed without your mind. without without giving away too much of the book, you know, right, relatively not, early right. on, they're like two guys talking, and they're talking about his past. They're just not talking about his death. He's sort of this very vital ninety-year-old man, so it lines up. But early on, he's taken into the confidence of Abelson's wife, and he realizes that he is one of these folks who's been brought back. And she she tells him this and confides in him right. for a reason. Right. And uh, I've I've been through that part. Right. But once again, I just sort of came to mind that that he had not even taken time to have looked just to, to but I mean I yeah. think it's it's one of the things that was fun to write this book is I mean in my own life 2004 there was a lot happening and so I had to like step back and remind myself like what existed in 2004 what were the ways sure. of being how did you get to politics and prose for a reading if you didn't know how to get there like you right. either called someone they give you directions or you like printed out directions from MapQuest like there was no nothing on your phone. You didn't have a. I didn't have a phone. I remember, I remember uh, coming back to the U.S. from Iraq in early 2005, and seeing this thing. Be like, what's this? What's a Wi-Fi? What's a Wi-Fi? These little Wi-Fi signs I see. Like, no, you, you know the internet. You don't have to plug in the wall anymore. What? Really? That's awesome. Yeah, no, you just go to these spots and like so. But I don't. We can't imagine. To I mean, I think it's 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 tough. You have to do the work to imagine that, and the different ways of being. So. Um, so to me, it seems sort of also more natural that you know you'd rent a place from someone, sure. you'd have drinks with them, they'd yeah. tell you about their life. There wouldn't be Not this either. thing we do now, which is when you meet someone after you've had them once or twice, you Google them and sort of figure out, all right, who are these? Who is this person? Like you know, right? Which which yeah. shows you where my mind was immediately. How I've uh, how adjusted. we all, but that's how we all live. Like we yeah. like there was sort of a more right. there was an innocence at that time. So yeah. one of the things I had a lot of fun in doing with the novel was trying to also just hew to. What was, like, what was it like? How, what was the interpersonal rela relations like? And how, in some ways, was it, um, I guess, gentler is Without the, word the technology I would, I would, I would yeah. land on. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, so I hope if you pick up the book, and thank you for doing so, yeah. uh, you'll think, you know, it's fun. That's one of the things that's fun with the book. There's even a MySpace reference in there somewhere if you get far <laughs> enough in. Thank you. Thank you. You, you answered this a bit um, in this last question, but I'm curious about, sorry. Thank you. Curious about your writing process um, and thinking about something that I think's fun about this novel is you have history, uh, someone writing history about a time where no one is alive anymore unless they're brought back. Um, and then also writing about a past that you 
weren't alive for. Um, then there's the past you are alive for and you remember, but you might be writing about a different people's experiences of that time. And then you also get to write about an alternative past, which didn't happen. And I'm curious in your process if you thought about writing in these periods kind of in different buckets yeah. or was the process very different? I'd love to hear more about um, all of those different time periods. Well, it's sort of, I mean, Lee's sick of hearing these, I don't know, I find them, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'll find in my life, I, I tell the story, I find myself telling stories about things that I'm interested in. So like Lee's heard me tell the story of um, Pickett's Charge, which I think, and the Battle of Fredericksburg to our kids, probably right, a number of times, and to you a few my, times. My, my father used to say, <laughs> I sell my cabbages twice, but they're but they're such good cabbages. Yeah, they're good, and I think it's a pretty good, pretty they're they're pretty good cabbages and they're great stories. And like people don't know these stories, so I'm like fascinated by some of these events, and they ra they've rattled around in my brain for years. Um, so that's sort of the history that I know. I think as Americans, um, there's something just within all of us where we're kind of obsessed by invention, reinvention, and you know, if you think about it, resurrection is kind of the ultimate form of reinvention and reinvention is sort of the idea of like what should have been or what could have been and there are all these little inflection points in the civil war i think is like the you know the the granddaddy of them all of like well if it only gone the other way um and so you know there's a moment in the book where i write about you know one of the one of the great civil war alternate histories is um Stonewall Jackson, who was sort of the great aggressive Confederate commander, was killed at the Battle of Chancellorsville in May of 1863. Gettysburg is, and the Chancellorsville was his great victory. And the night after the victory, he was going to launch a counterattack. He was doing a reconnaissance when he came back into his lines. A Confederate soldier shot him through the arm, and he died of pneumonia two days later. So his own, his own troops shot him dead. And there's always been this speculation what if Stonewall Jackson had been at Gettysburg? And there's all these scenarios and moments where the troops who would have been under his command, you know, a decision was made that wasn't that aggressive. And if Stonewall had been there, they would have done it different, and they would have held that hill, and, you know, the North, the North would have lost. And, and so, you know, you always, so I've heard enough of those stories, but, well, you know, let's, let, why don't I play around with them? And then, you know, and so you're telling alternate histories inside of an alternate history, which is really just a different way, a way of saying, like, we're kind of reimagining and rethinking parts of America and how our country would be different. And because this is a nation um, that people come to, to you know, reinvent or remake their lives from all over the world, that so many people wound up here that way, um, and is a nation that was sort of founded on 18th century enlightenment ideals. Um, yeah, I think that's something that's intuitive to us and it felt intuitive to me as a son of this country and I wanted to play with it in the book and I, yeah, and I hope it works. Other. Um, you talk a lot about great compromise requiring like storytelling and like nuanced understanding of that storytelling. And I also I've heard you talk about in other interviews about how like uh, politicization of everything is like the sign of a society in, in turmoil, essentially. So I feel like those conversations have to have have to happen at like the family level or so on and so forth. But you don't want to have those conversations. You don't want to politicize everything at that personal level. So I guess how do you have those conversations and that storytelling to reach that nuanced understanding, but also avoid politicizing everything in the process. Well, I'm going to give an answer. It might not be the right answer, but I'll 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 try. I think like I think I think st this is why I think stories matter because I think if you know if you have someone who you're having a, a true disagreement with and you have to and you have to compromise with them or you have to get to some type of outcome at a certain point, you have to like take four or five deep breaths. Like, all right, I am going to imagine I am this person who I loathe and who I do not understand, who I think is a monster, but I've got, I've got to imagine that I am them so that I can figure out what the hell they really want and I can offer them something that will get me what I really want. So when you think about it, all compromise is in and of itself sort of an, an empathetic act because you are forcing yourself to inhabit the needs and wants of the other person to see if there is any conceivable Venn diagram, any conceivable overlap. Um, so it requires a degree of imagination um, that I think, you know, reading novels, writing movies, you know, watching movies, you know, and just engaging in culture um, fosters. So I know that's like not a silver bullet answer, but it's, it's the best one I've got. There, there was an SNL skit after the 2016 election, and the premise of the skit was it's Thanksgiving 2016, going home to be with all your family members and their 
political views. And so like it's not going well until one family member, this is my me recollection of it, breaks out into singing Adele's Hello. And then everyone around, around the table starts singing Adele's Hello at the same time. And then they all sing Hello together. And then that's the only way to end the, end the arguments. So I am fascinated when a novelist decides to write an alternate history. Is, is, it, is it easier at all because you're dealing with characters, you know, like we know who Al Gore is, we don't have to invent him, or is it trickier and harder to do an alternate history? It, I think, every, listen, every book and every, and every story and every, you know, every form of art has rules to it. The second you decide you're like going to engage, you know, the second I decide I'm going to write a sonnet, there's rules, or I'm going to sing a song, there's rules. The second I decide I'm going to write an alternate history with cryo regeneration set in 2004 where Al Gore is president, there are some rules for me, and I can't break those rules. And so it has to sort of, you know, it has to, I can bend certain facts, but I can bend them and, you know, they can't quite break. So I have to create this world in a way that, um, that feels plausible. But when you get into the book, the book is not like about Al Gore. You know, I think Al Gore is kind of boring. Um, it's just, it's creating this world so that this man, Abelson, you can see him try to walk through it um, and you can get insight into his life and you can understand, um, you know, the challenges that he's faced, um, what his family's going through, uh, and see the way that uh, a society that's much like our own judges someone who is a good person but finds himself a little bit out of step. Right, but you could have put him um, in a, 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 not an, alter, an alternate historical world. You could have created a, a, um, a fictional, entirely But I wanted the stakes. But I wanted the stakes to be one people would care about. I wanted it to be America. And I wanted it to be a place that you could you could recognize, but um, that felt uncanny. Like there's this idea of the uncanny in art, which is that like if if you were to have a robot at home that like fixed you dinner and talked to you, would it be more or less? It would probably be less creepy if that robot looked like R two D two, right? Like kind of cute and dee -doo 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 -doo. would it be more creepy if that robot looked like? 98% like this beautiful woman right here, but there was like this 2% thing that was like a little off and her eyes sometimes went like this. Like that would be really creepy. It's the uncanny yeah, valley. That's the uncanny, yeah. And I wanted the world, once you got into it, to feel like just a little uncanny and unsettling. And I think it was the New York Times reviewer too, as a way of describing the nuance of the book, says, well, Al Gore, he ended death and he still lost the ne next election. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's as a way of saying, you know, our political fortunes are fickle and not in within our control all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Any other questions? Oh. Thank you. Can I take Thank the prerogative, you. just the last question, just for you? Will you just tell everyone what you're working on? Because you're going to be back here in January. Just tell us what you're working on. Sure. Um, <laughs> Well, I was not working on a lot in COVID except for uh, the children, but Elliot, you encouraged me to try and write again. Um, and I had been reading about our CIA station chief in Beirut in the 80s, like really uplifting stuff in the dark days of COVID, um, who was um, kidnapped and assassinated tragically. And then 20, almost 25 years later, in a joint CIA Mossad operation, a Hezbollah leader was killed in a car bombing. And for some reason, those two different episodes made me think about how sometimes revenge takes a long time, or anything can take a long time. We're so used, we're so attention deprived, depraved, and we all want neat endings, especially for wars, and so, the idea of the book was, what if a group of young guys together endured a horrible tragedy in their 20s, and it took them decades to make it right? It's called Ilium. Ilium, January. Hope to see some of you here. <laughs> Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Thank you.